Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're about to start. Uh, before we do, a quick request. May I uh, ask you to put your mobile phones on silent or vibrate? Uh, I think I heard a lot of phones going off in the previous session, and that's frankly quite embarrassing to everyone. So uh, on that note, uh, let me also uh, introduce our uh, session, which is uh, hearing about the stories of four uh, cities and uh, how they've tackled the issues of air pollution and transport. Uh, these are very interesting cities. I think you've got a precursor already from the, uh, the Mexican ambassador to India, uh, and also a precursor into the challenges that you would face or we would face as we try and uh, tackle some of these on-ground issues, uh, which are not just administrative, but political, but social, uh, as also the uh, Minister of State referred to in his speech. So uh, the format that we're going to follow is uh, each of our four speakers are going to present for about 10 minutes uh, each, after which uh, we'll have a discussion and hopefully also involve you in questions and uh, comments on uh, the, the issues that have, been, that have been brought up during those presentations. So I'm going to start off by uh, requesting, and I'll go from my left to my right. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, first uh, Daizong Liu from uh, uh, the WRI uh, to speak. Uh, Daizong Liu is China Transport Program Director at the World Resources Institute. Uh, he uh, leads and provides technical guidance to professionals working for the implementation of projects in China under the WRI Sustainable City Strategy. He earlier worked as Senior Program Manager of China Sustainable Transportation Center, and he holds a Master's Degree in Transportation Engineering from the National University of Singapore, and a Bachelor's Degree in Traffic Engineering from the Southeast University. Interestingly, he also runs a non-profit social media platform at WE Chat. Uh, it's called Sustainable City, and uh, WE Chat is the equivalent of, uh, the Chinese equivalent of WhatsApp. And uh, it brings about 70 professionals focused on this issue together and, and talk about it. And this has thousands of followers. Uh, I'm Govindra Jaithiraj. I'm a journalist. I'm here in the context of being the founder of India Spend. We are a data journalism initiative. Uh, early last, uh, late last year, we launched our own network, low cost network of air quality monitoring devices. It's the largest of its kind in India, where we actually monitor air quality real time uh, in about four cities right now and we're expanding, the whole idea being that using technology, Internet of Things, sensors, can we as citizens or journalists uh, come closer to the source of data and therefore make the whole debate more informed. So that's really uh, our objective. So on that note, may I now uh, ask Daizong to make his presentation. Thank you, my friends and colleagues. Yeah, it's my honor to present uh, what we did for China uh, here. So uh, this is my first trip to India. But when I come here, I think uh, <laughs> the worst city is not Delhi, it's Beijing, <laughs> because of this. <Wow>. So, <laughs> so uh, actually now uh, the air pollution in China is really very heavy now. And, uh, uh, it's not only fo focus on the traffic congestion, it's also focus on the air pollution. So we do some uh, modeling with the uh, Beijing government that 30% of the PM 2.5 is contributed by transport side. So we need to know the challenge of China. So it's the first thing we can, we can go into uh, Beijing. The challenge of Beijing is that during the last uh, 30 years, the citizen, the population of Beijing is doubled. And, but you can see uh, the car ownership is three times compared with 30 years ago. So uh, we have very fast uh, the car, uh, car use age and uh, car ownerships. And that chart show you the component of uh, air pollution gases. And you can see the 86% uh, of the CO2 is contributed by transportation side and the NOx and the PM. So uh, currently Beijing already changed the economic structures 
we already move a lot of uh, heavy industry outside of the city, but the air pollution is still very heavy. That means the transportation is very critical element and uh, issues we need to, to uh, fight with. And this is a figure that's uh, in China we have five years plan. In each five years plan, we will decide how to use our money, the government money and budget. So you can compare with the last three, five years plan in the uh, years 1906 to 2000, the, we call it a nice five years plan. The public transit investment only 18% of the all the transportation investment. That means most of the money going to the road construction. We made a lot of road. But you can see the tree in the uh, 2001 and 2005, it's our 10 five years plan. The public transit investment already grew to uh, 59%. And now, this year is the 13th, 13th year, uh, five years plan. The China, uh, the Beijing investment into the transit systems uh, grew up to the 70% of all the budget. So we use this money to do what? Metro. metro systems. Yeah, you can see in the last 15 years, the Beijing metro systems expand very fast from 55 kilometers in the year 2000. Grew up very fast to the 527 kilometers. It's already uh, bigger than a uh, 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 store of Korea. So we use a lot of money in uh, metro systems and uh, uh, attract people to use public transportation. And then we also investment in our BRT systems and the bus line systems. You can see Beijing now, we have uh, almost 400 the bus line systems now. And the very interesting thing is, we are not only treat the bus only line as, uh, as public transportation measures, we also think it's kind of a TDM. That means uh, we want to move the people from the car lines to the transit line. And that's not enough by your only investment in the public transportation. Because you see, uh, the figure is the congestion index of Beijing. So congestion is still very high. So this is why uh, recently we are working with the Beijing uh, Transportation Committee to focus on the more uh, clearly car ownership and the car usage control policies. So currently Beijing has two kind of uh, uh, policies similar as the Michigan City or Delhi. We have a tra traffic uh, uh, restrictions. So based on the last uh, digit of your, your vehicle numbers, each working day, that we have a 20% of car cannot be used. And also we control the car ownerships. Uh, every month, only 20,000 uh, the new the uh, the, the, the plates of vehicle can be issued. So the people need to go into the lottery. That I, uh, I'm not lucky, I lottery for five years, you don't get the new You don't need a car. <laughs> yeah, but I just <laughs> want to try this. <laughs> anyway, uh, but this is the exi uh, existing situations. But we still have uh, Beijing, because air pollution issues, we still have very high uh, ambitions to work more hard in transportation side. Uh, currently, uh, WR China, we are working with the Beijing Transportation uh, Emission Center. It belongs to the Beijing Transportation Committee to help them to build the transportation emission model. This emission model will help our decision maker to make a real the, the strategy or plan for how to control the air pollution. For example, we, uh, we now uh, uh, have one research, interesting research to compare the low emission zone and the congestion charges. Maybe you already know the low emission zone are more focused on the, tr uh, the cargo, the tracks, and the congestion charge more focused on the uh, the passenger cars. So we compare it, you can find from the air pollution side, the cargo, the track is more, more important from this uh, modeling, the evaluation. So, the, so, so, so this will be help our, our, our decision maker from the, uh, the air pollution, how we use the policies and what kind of output can produce. But this now means the congestion charge is not important. This year, this is just the finished our People Congress of the Beijing government. You know the People Congress members are from all industries. They are not the transportation expert. So we need to do the uh, a, a pe uh, public communication. We produce a lot of uh, uh, this kind of uh, brochure 
to our People Congress members to, 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 to introduce why congestion charging is important to uh, we are fighting the air pollution and the control the traffic congestion. And we also work with other cities in China, like Qingdao is a very big seaport uh, cities. And Qingdao may be meet the different situations because the ship, the air pollution is very important. Very dirty air pollution is coming from ship. So we need to evaluate, use our tools to evaluate how the, the local government to make the, the low carbon transportation strategy to control the, the seaport air pollution. And we also work with Chengdu. Uh, when we, uh, uh, Chengdu is kind of city like uh, 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 Beijing. They want to invest a lot of money into the uh, uh, metro systems. But when you use a lot of money for metro system, means the land around the station will be very high price. And the high price means only high income people so are living around your stations and push your passengers, your transit passengers far away from your TOD side. So this is why we also need to produce the, the PPP guidelines. It's kind of a financing methodology. We need to coordinate the public and the private partnership to help we can make a, a, a fold, a, a, a affordable housing plan around our TOD side. So this is why we combine the TOD with the PPP together. And we're also thinking transportation emission not only traffic uh, 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 impact, we also have impact of a social cost. Social cost means your, your road safety, your, your air pollution, your health, and uh, 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 even your time. So we now currently we are working with Chengdu cities to uh, evaluate the transportation emission, how to impact our social cost. And the last one, the WI China also work with the Ministry of uh, Transportation. In the national level, uh, 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 China, uh, the, the Ministry of Transportation uh, just issued a program called the Transit Metropolis Programs. We pick up 37 cities in China. It's similar like uh, a, a smart cities in India. And the government, the central government will finance the local city to promote the public transportation, both quality and the quantities. So we are focused on the target that improve the bus share to 50 to 60 percent improve in these uh, pilot cities. And the uh, China are work with very close with the uh, Ministry of Transportation to promote to have the pilot cities. And uh, we also need to uh, finalize summary our experience to be a national level policy guidelines and standard. So that's all we did for China. Thank you. Yeah, very good timing. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Darayo Hidalgo from uh, the Embark Inter Network International stream of transport engineers, urban planning specialists, and environmental scientists. He also coordinates the obs observatory of the BRT ALC Center of Excellence. He has more than 20 years of uh, experience as a transport expert, consultant, and a government official. He's taken part in urban transport projects, taught training courses in 10 countries, uh, more than 10 countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. He's also a lecturer in urban planning and the author of 55 publications and conference presentations, including an extensive review of bus systems in developing countries. Uh, Darayo holds a PhD and MSc degrees in transportation planning from the Ohio State University and a civil engineering degree from the Universidad de Los Andes, Colombia, and he lives in uh, Bogota, Colombia, and I hand over to him. Yeah, thank you. I'm comfortable for <laughs> This is my 20th trip to India, so I'll come often. <laughs> and it has been a, a very interesting to see progress and also uh, different things that have changed. And my first visit to, to India was to talk about, about Bogota and what has happened. And also this time around, I'm, I'm talking about Bogota, but from the air quality perspective. And this is, this is something that is really, really interesting to see in the city of Bogota, because we are progressing. Most cities in the world, Mexico, Beijing, here, uh, Delhi, 
are having worse condition as time goes by. My city, Bogota, has been able to progress, and progress really steadily, but we are not there yet. We still need to work hard on meeting the standards. In this graphic, you see the monthly average of PM in the blue line, and you see it declining. Uh, since 2013, the city is also measuring uh, PM 2.5, and it's also declining, uh, but, but they don't have declined to the point to meet the standards that have been set by the World Care Organization. So that's what the challenge for the, for the near future is. And the keys to the progress in Bogota are four. First, the city's plan to be a better city. It's not just managing air quality. It's to be a better city overall. And these plans are not just plans that are sitting on shelves are actionable, are things are going on with these plans. It's not that the city has a very good study and, and does nothing with it. It has done the studies but have uh, been meeting some of the recommendations, not all. And then a uh, key to the progress is continuous measuring and continuous management and adapting and, and making new things as, as, as the measures don't show necessarily that progress has been met. And one of the most important elements of the progress in Bogota has been the reduction of sulfur content in diesel. And I will talk a little bit about it. And I was very pleased to see the Minister of, of uh, Oil and Gas here in India saying that you will have a Euro 6 standard for 2020. It's, it's really, really an important element in, in, in reduction of air pollution. Talking about Bogota, it's important to recognize that it's a, a, a city that is very high above the sea level, to 2,600 meters closer to the stars. Nine million people live in this urban area. It's the ninth densest uh, urban area in the world, uh, with 13,000, uh, more than 13,000 people per square kilometer. And the GDP is around 20,000 US per capita. It's a middle income city, it's growing, so car ownership, motorcycle ownership, because of this income is rising as well. And in terms of air quality, we see this condition. is not, uh, this is a picture from Universidad Nacional uh, looking at the hills in the east side of my city. And what we see in terms of not just seeing the air pollution is feeling the effects. 600,000 kids below five years old need to go at some point of the year to be seen by a doctor. 29,000 of them are received in emergency room through, uh, because of acute respiratory disease. And this is something that is not acceptable. Not acceptable at all because 80 kids every year are dying because of this condition. And this is not something any city of the world can accept. We have an average of just 70 micrograms per square meter uh, in, the, in the period from 2002 to 2008, while the uh, standard for, uh, set by the World Health Organization is 20. So we need to do, put our act together and move on in terms of improving air quality. And what has been done? Many things not just one single thing. But the most important activity is doing transportation in the better way possible. Creating a space for pedestrians, creating a space for bicyclists, uh, doing days without cars, and also uh, doing some car restrictions and truck and bus restrictions, and introducing one of the most interesting bus rapid tr uh, transit systems in the world, which is called Transmillennium. Transmillennial right now is 112 kilometers, 2.4 million passengers every day in buses, in high quality buses that operate on, uh, on single lanes and have uh, stations, uh, fare collection, ITS, all the elements of a complete BRT system. Uh, and also along the BRT system, a very important uh, introduction of, of bike lanes. Bicycle was not a mode of transport in Bogota 15 years ago. Less than 1% of the population was using bicycles. After the construction of more than 400 kilometers of permanent bike lanes, 
and a promotion of bike use in different means. Right now, 4.5% of the commuters use bicycle as an every, every day. So it's a very important increase in bike use in the city. And with these measures, bike increase, introduction of bus rapid transit and an integrated public transport system, the city has been able to do something that is rare for a developing city and is controlling the rise in the use of cars and motorcycles. It has been a, a control over these two, uh, 15 years uh, below 20%. In other places of my own country, it has been increasing. So it's a very important achievement that all these policies have resulted in better transport. And it's not just better transport, it's also a uh, life saved in terms of uh, traffic incidents in the city have been declining year by year. Now it's kind of stabilized because of some increase in motorcycle use, but the city can, see, can say that they, it has saved lives because of road safety. So doing the city right is not just good for the air quality, it's good in many other ways. For air quality particularly, <coughs> the city has a plan, a very, very developed plan called the Decadel the air, Con air Decontamination Plan 2010-2020, which was aimed at meeting the World Health Organization standard. This plan uh, started by improving greatly the monitoring network for air quality. You don't, you're not able to manage if you don't know. So having a real uh, uh, world-class monitor air quality monitoring network that has been progressing over time, this graph shows how the, the network has been progressing, it's, you're able to see what is the condition in the city. And this graph show the average of 2009. You see that the eastern part of the city is cleaner than the western and southern part of the city. And, in the, and the other graph shows the extreme events. So the, the very high concentrations that may happen at extreme events. And if you have this monitoring, you're able to uh, move uh, along the path of, of improvement. And you ha can see the improvement in the city of Bogota. Year by year, 2009 to 2013, you see the reduction of the concentrations. We have not solved the problem, but we have ad advanced. And I repeat the graph that I showed at the beginning, a steady progress, but not there, but not there yet. <laughs> Key to the decontamination measures, controlling fixed sources, filters in the, in, in the stacks in the, in the factories and relocation of some factories, Vehicle restriction for trucks and buses, which are the most highly polluting vehicles using license plate number. Also car restriction using plate numbers since 1998 on the peak hours. Now we are odd even all year round. All year round, Bogota is odd even. It's not just 15 days, it's the whole year. Why? Because cars are also producing congestion Accid uh, traffic accidents and also for air pollution. But it's mainly for mobility, not mainly for air quality. Bus fleet renewal has been a very important part of the strategy, including hybrid buses, cleaner diesel, and piloting electric taxi cabs. This is the fleet of uh, hybrid electric vehicles being operated in the city of Bogota, 248 uh, for three years now. Uh, it's, a, it's the most, uh, the largest fleet of hybrids in, in the Americas at this point. Only China has larger fleets in, uh, of hybrids in, in their cities. And it is a very important element of the integrated transport system that the city is working uh, about. But then reducing sulfur content in diesel. Uh, we w had really poor quality in the country. In 2007 it was 4,000 4, parts per million content of sulfur. In the city of Bogota at that time was uh, regulated to be one fourth, 1,000, but 1,000 was too much. So the mandate by the Minister of Environment and the Secretary of Environment of the city was to reduce it. In 2008 was 259 parts. In January 2010 was 50 parts ahead of the country that in 2013 uh, went below to 50 parts. But 50 parts is uh, still too much. We need to continue uh, reducing the sulfur content. Now, the way forward, because the city has not solved all the problems. 
The main part of it will be completing the implementation of the integrated bus system and removal of the older bus fleet that is still very polluting. The new fleets need to be Euro 6 standard starting next year, not in 2020. Next year, Euro 6 standard for the new bus fleets, including diesel particulate filters. Increase of the use of bicycles and the dream of Enrique Peñalosa in his inaugural speech was doubling the, the use of bicycles from 5.5% to 9% by in, in, in four years and introduce demand management measures. Right now, the City Council of Bogota is discussing parking management using a surcharge in parking as a demand management measure. With all these things together, the city is expected in 2020 to reduce 60% the emissions of particulate matter as compared to business as usual. So it's a, a story of success, but not, not there yet. So I hope these ideas are helpful for the debate here in India and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Drayo. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, J. Victor Hugo Paramo Figueroa. Uh, he's the Director General of the National Institute for Climate Change, a chemical engineer from the University in Mexico. He got a Master and Doctor's degrees uh, from France. Uh, he's worked uh, in the Federal Ministry of the Environment of Mexico from 1987 to 2000, worked with the National Institute of Ecology. Uh, amongst its principal responsibilities, he had to participate and coordinate the elaboration of air quality management programs for the principal cities of Mexico. From 2000 to 2013, he worked for the Mexico City Environment Sec as for the Mexico City Environment Secretary as Director General of Air Quality Management. Since 2013, he's been working uh, for the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, which is an environmental research institute occupying the position of General Coordinator for Environmental Pollution and Health. Good afternoon. Um, I am very glad to be here. It's the first time I I come to to India, and certainly it's a, an exciting exciting experience. Um, I I work for an institute in which uh, uh, our main uh, duty is to support the the governments be the federal governments or the local governments in terms of uh, approaching them information in such a way that they can make decision making. Uh, we, we know that uh, and mainly in air quality management you need uh, uh, information that is based in scientific knowledge. Is, is very important. If not, you have the risk of make wrong decisions and are, that are, can be very cost. Uh, well, my colleagues show that uh, megacities or metropolitan areas has, has problems of uh, a growing population, a growing number of vehicles, growing uh, consumption patterns, etc. But uh, the deal is how to make that at the same time that you have this growing, that can mean uh, social development, you can uh, reduce uh, pollutants from the air. And that is what uh, we can see for Mexico City uh, through the air quality monitoring. You can show this. Uh, here you have three figures. The first one belongs to the ozone concentrations. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are certain, uh, like uh, bars, and each bar corresponds to one year of uh, uh, data. Uh, inside these bars you have small squares, and each square is one day uh, data is the, the maximum concentration of the day of the pollutant. So you have for ozone, for PM10, and for PM2.5. Uh, the, the, the bigger uh, figure is that ozone who was uh, uh, monitored for the first time in 1986. 
uh, this graph goes to year 2014. So you can see uh, uh, the, the, the colors means that if you are in green, you have very good air quality. If you have uh, yellow, you have moderate air quality, but still uh, accomplishing the uh, standards. And when you have red or violet or brown, then you are uh, in very bad, bad, very bad, and very extremely bad air quality. So you can see that uh, during the 80s and 90s, we had a lot of, a lot of days with very, very bad air quality. Uh, that improved through the years, and uh, um, uh, still uh, we, don't, we, we don't have all the days uh, of good quality. We have, uh, as I will show you in another graph, uh, many days that do not accomplish. For the PM10, uh, um, you, you can see that, for example, you have a pattern of uh, a lot of yellow uh, days, uh, and you have uh, more uh, green days that are very good air quality, but that, that, is, that belongs to the rainy season in Mexico. So also the nature helps to have good air quality. And in the extreme, Right, you have the PM 2.5 that uh, it began to be monitored since year 2004. So uh, there you can see uh, mainly that during the, the dry season and the winter season, you have the most polluted days. But how, how to, to improve their quality? One essential thing is to have continuous programs. We have had that in Mexico beginning the 19th and uh, to up to date we have these programs that are being applied by the federal government and the local governments and in the metropolitan area. There are several uh, measures that have been uh, applied and maintained during these programs like the inspection and maintenance program for vehicles uh, the no driving day program. Uh, the monitoring is essential because it's the way the society can know uh, if the air is improving or not. Um, uh, there is uh, also a smog and particularly alert program that actually we are applying today in, today in Mexico City. Uh, I, I will show you uh, in, a, in other figure why. And well, uh, it is also important to improve the, the, the fuels, be for vehicles or industrial or domestic. And of course, you must look to have cleaner and more effective vehicles more and more. Well, how, how uh, I, I'm going to show very quickly for the, the urban pollutants, how this has been accomplished. For example, here you have the, the graph for the, the lead. Uh, you know, the lead is a very bad pollutant that uh, we, had, uh, we had a serious pro problem of lead in Mexico City um, in such a way that uh, when the blood of children was analyzed, they didn't accomplish the the, the health safety standards. Uh, and that was because uh, we added lead to the gasoline uh, to, to, to increase the, the obtained number content. Uh, we began with a program uh, phasing out the lead content of the gasoline and uh, beginning the year 1993, we began to accomplish the international standard for lead. And that, that was very simple. Uh, the lead was in gasoline because we added lead to the gasoline. We stop added lead and immediately we look that the air, uh, air quality met the standard. Uh, there is also the case of sulfur dioxide. Um, here, uh, in general, there is a, a descending trend, but with some peaks. Uh, beginning in 1988, we began to use natural gas in industries. And in 1991, uh, we start 
to replace the the fuels uh, with with others with less sulfur content, and we pursued that until year 1998, in which we established uh, uh <coughs> a limit of sulfur in in the fuels that is one percent of sulfur content, but uh, we don't see the trend that uh, clearly because, for example, when you have this big peak in around year 2001 is because uh, industries began to use uh, uh, illegally uh, uh, introduced fuels to the metropolitan area. Uh, that, that was because in for the metropolitan area of Mexico City, we established very strict limits of sulfur content, but in the rest of the country not. So uh, some industries went to other states and bought these high sulfur uh, fuels and began to use it. Fortunately, we had the air quality monitoring and we identified that immediately we uh, give this information to the, to the inspectors and they proceed to control. Uh, Actually, sulfur uh, meet the, the standards for uh, protection of health, and uh, we are pursuing uh, to reduce the, the sulfur steel because new technologies uh, for diesel vehicles needed. It's not because we are not uh, meeting the air quality standard, but is in order to let these uh, new technologies uh, of diesel vehicles can be introduced in Mexico. Another uh, case is the case of carbon monoxide that, pro that are produced mainly by uh, gasoline vehicles. And there, uh, there were two, two main uh, measures. One was to uh, improve the quality of, of gasolines, uh, uh, putting more oxygen in the composition and uh, the other one was the use of catalytic converters in cars. And uh, also uh, here the inspection and maintenance program helped to reduce the, the concentrations in the air of carbon monoxide in such a way that since 1999 we are meeting the air quality standard for this pollutant. Um, when we arrive to, to particulates that is that is other history. And I, I don't know uh, very well what is the situation here in India, but in Mexico, uh, our country is a semi-desertic country. So we have a lot of uh, dust. dust that comes from the surroundings of the city and that makes that concentrations are uh, all the time uh, uh, at high levels. So um, when, when we knew that, we began to apply uh, programs uh, consisting of uh, reforesting activities and preservation of, uh, of uh, forest ar ar that surrounds the, the metropolitan area. Uh, of course, there is also industrial and vehicular sources for this pollutant, but uh, I think that uh, it's essential to identify very uh, precisely wha what are the sources of dust. Uh, in this case, we do not meet the, the standards. Uh, we have a problem of PM10 and also on PM2.5. And in the case of ozone, um, here you have a graph in which I, I put several of the actions implemented in the 1990. Um, the day without car was because of that, because we had very high ozone days. Um, uh, we uh, uh, made that the, the, the heavy industry that was located almost in the downtown, uh, came to the, to the, to the periphery of the, of the metropolitan area. Uh, for the cars, well, I mentioned it, the installation of catalytic converters and the use of uh, less uh, reactive uh, gasolines uh, in cars also. 
and uh, also a very important measure that is needed for control of ozone is to implement vapor recovery systems in gasoline stations. Yeah. This is a, a, an essential measure that must be applied because the amount of uh, vapors that are liberated during the, the replenishment of, of cars is very, very important. Uh, let's say that these technological measures uh, st started in the 90s and finished more or less in the year two 2000 over there. And from there, we, we had to, to begin to implement other, uh, other kind of measures that leads with uh, tr public transportation. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, constructed um, new metro lines and beginning to implement the BRTs and the public bicycle system in the city. Um, we do not meet the, the uh, standard, and uh, even there is something that happened uh, very recently, um, this year. Um, we began to have very high peaks of ozone that are comparable to those that we had around 10 years ago. And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, we had uh, 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 a trend that was uh, decreasing the concentrations, but uh, surprisingly and suddenly we had this, this increase uh, two weeks ago. What happened? Uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, in the 90s we began to apply the mandatory day without car, in which uh, that made that uh, a portion of vehicles could not circulate every day. It's about uh, around 20% uh, per day. Um, in order that we could uh, uh, promote the introduction of cleaner vehicles, we began to exempt those that uh, had very low emissions. So that makes that these 20% uh, initial values of cars that didn't circulate were decreasing. And for example, in year 2015, uh, only 55% of the cars was uh, limited of the circulation. If you divide this 55% uh, between five days of the working week, you have about 11% uh, uh, of the cars that didn't circulate. And that was uh, in um, in, uh, in June of last year. Uh, what happened is that uh, beginning July of last year, the local authorities decided to um, liberate, uh, to let the circulation uh, of uh, uh, a bigger number of vehicles. And instead of having this 11% of cars that didn't circulate daily, they reduce it to 3%. So what happened? Uh, what happened is that the congestion increased suddenly. The speed of vehicles was reduced suddenly, and that made that the traffic congestion uh, be worst. And uh, what we think is that the the increase in the number of vehicles circulating and, and the, uh, this congestion that was increased made that the speed of circulation of the vehicles in average was reduced drastically. And uh, we know, for example, that the uh, volatile organic compounds that is a precursor of ozone in Mexico City metropolitan area is the pollutant that is uh, controlling the ozone production. So more VOCs means more ozone. So um, the here the let's say the, the what we learn is that uh, it one you you must be very careful when you make the decisions of what to do or how the programs uh, evolve. 
if you don't measure, if you don't have uh, enough information that makes that these uh, measures are going to to improve the air quality, please don't do it. Um, well, uh, finally, there are several uh, measures that need to still to be implemented. It's not uh, it's not finished. For example, the city continues to grow, and the this problem is a, a real program. The the city is more and more extended, making that uh, more and more uh, vehicle uh, kilometers per vehicle are traveled every year. Uh, we need to integrate a high capacity metropolitan transport system is uh, something that maybe um, as long as I understand is a, is a very good proposal to, to that are doing in, in China a national uh, a mandate that makes that the, the transportation in the metropolitan areas be integrated is uh, very very good um, uh, also, we, we are studying how to make uh, ecosystemic planning of the metropolitan area. That means uh, to understand why uh, trips are done by people. That is essential to propose, to propose uh, ways of not doing or to reduce them. And of course, there are measures that are being applied everywhere, like uh, bicycles, walking, um, uh, clean fuels, etc. That uh, well, uh, in Mexico we have done a few, but we need to need more and more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Victor Hugo. Can I uh, introduce now uh, Anumita Roy Chaudhary, who's uh, the Executive Director of Research and Advocacy and Head of Air Pollution and Clean Transportation at the Center for Science and Environment. Uh, she's been coordinating a, a lot of policy research and advocacy on vehicular pollution in the country and in uh, New Delhi. She's helped uh, build policy campaigns which include phasing in of the CNG program in Delhi, uh, advancing implementation of improved fuel quality norms and emission standards in the city. She has also co-authored a book called Slow Murder, The Deadly Story of Vehicular Pollution in India, and has contributed to the series on Citizens Report and the State of India's Environment. Uh, Anumita, all yours. Thank you, Govind, and thank you, WRI, for giving this great opportunity for this conversation. <clears throat> been really looking forward to it. So, Delhi story, it's a very well-known story, complicated story, but full of exciting drama. And many of us here from Delhi and other Indian cities also know this story pretty well. But like a good fable, it's good to hear this story again and again so that we can draw good lessons for the future to be better. So, it. Air pollution in Delhi hits headlines. And when we look back, it's the story, this action that has started long time ago. It's not that Delhi is discussing air pollution today. We go back in time to the late 90s. And when there was a lot of anger in the city, pollution levels were high, very little data on what pollution levels are like, what is doing to our health, but even that little data showed that there was at least one death per hour due to air pollution related diseases in this city. And that did trigger action. And it's in very interesting that when you look at, look back to that late 90s and the first part of the last decade, we find that at that point of time, when we had a lot less data in the city, much less conversation, very few could understand this problem, we didn't have platform like this where people from all over the world could come, convene, and discuss with each other, share concerns, discuss their experience, bring science on the table. But even then, we could push for, and this daily could push for, what we say the first generation action. When you look at that menu of action, it's actually not that bad. So if you look at vehicles, they could improve emission standards for vehicles, moved from Euro zero to one, to two, to three, and now finally to Euro four. 
Um, you could see that one of the big transition that happened then was that when you were at your zero level, the big decision that was taken that to move entire public transport to natural gas and leapfrog to much cleaner emissions. At the same time, you controlled lead, benzene in fuels. You introduced premix fuel for your two wheelers. Uh, you phased out 50 year old commercial vehicles. You strengthened vehicle inspection program to some extent. In many of the polluting industry were taken out of the city. Uh, coal based power plants, some of them were shut, some put on natural gas to the extent that today it's one coal based power plant in the city. There was a ban on open burning, legal ban was brought in, but as we could see, that was very poorly enforced. It never really made much of an impact. But the fact of the matter is, this is the way we moved ahead, and we did see some improvement in the air quality. And that's the story to recall. So as an impact of all that action, we could see some decline in pollution. We said it's stabilization. We said it's arresting of the trend. But then, today when we are looking back, and last few years, it's very clear that we have lost the gains. Pollution levels are going up. Today we are talking about multi-pollutant crisis in the city. It's just now the tiny particles going up, nitrogen oxide going up. There's a ozone problem in the city. And clearly, it's a heavy toxic pollution that we're breathing on a daily basis. So this is truly the time to sit at the crossroad today and have a good conversation around that what went wrong and what do we need to do now? So what is the second generation challenge? The good thing about the second generation challenge and the way Delhi is much better prepared today because they know better today. There's a lot more information. There's a lot more information on the air pollution levels, on health outcomes. To know that so if you look at the studies, and the big studies that have carried out in the city that clearly shows that the lung of every third child is impaired. And this study done on 12,000 school kids in Delhi. At the same time, when you look at this kind of biomarkers, it goes much beyond the data. To say that the biomarker that your body is stressed from pollution, just look at the comparability here. The 14-year-old child, and look the body under stress in Delhi, and how it compares with a taxi driver who is occupationally exposed to very high pollution levels in Kolkata, is virtually the same. And very clearly, these biomarkers, the macrophages that you see in the sputum of children and people, they correlate so strongly with the pollution levels in different parts of the city. So wherever you have high particulate levels, you do see this kind of these very high levels of these biomarkers in people who live there. Today we know a lot more about health outcomes, the diversity in the health outcomes. We are, not, we are no longer talking about only respiratory problem. We are talking about cardiovascular, eye problems, cellular changes, cancer, diabetes, blood pressure, effect on brain, fetus, and it's scary. And when you look at the cancer data and the forecast, the official forecast for the country, what they're saying is it's just not the short-term risk, it is also the long-term risk. Because today, the numbers are saying that cancer, which is expected to blow up as an epidemic in the future, if you have to deal with it, you have to reduce the toxic exposure today. Because it is a latent risk. The exposure today will blow up in the future. So just understand the threat, and that we, all of us as a community understand the risk a lot better. Today, we also understand a lot better where the pollution is coming from. The very recent study that has been carried out by the IIT Kanpur in Delhi, that is a pretty good picture of where pollution is coming from. And in this, you find that vehicles contribute about 20%. But somewhere along the line, and there's a message that we really need to give out to the policy community and everyone else, that while it's good to have a science like this to provide support for policy action, but scientific community will also have to come out to interpret the data for policy action. Often what we find is that there is a fight between the pie slices in the pie chart. So the vehicles <laughs> will say, I'm only 20%. Someone will know that's 3%. And 20%, and the automobile industry will say, but the cars are 3%, you can really look at it. But if cars are 3%, so are the construction does, so is the solid waste burning. Now, I just heard Beijing, China, Beijing said 30%. But someone has to say at 30%, at 20%, why Beijing today has to restrict the car that can be sold in the city? Why they have to leave prop to Euro 6? Why do they have to take so many harsh measures? Now, that is the lesson that has to come out. Otherwise, you'll never understand the importance of this 20%. And that's where we are getting stuck today. And very important uh, information that has come out from this study is 
that this is only primary emissions. But when you consider the gaseous pollution and how they convert in the air to contribute to the secondary particulates, then the share of vehicles are actually going to go up because the nitrogen oxide is going to convert into nitrate, sulfur dioxide is going to convert into sulfur particles, and that's the th risk that we really need to understand a lot better. But one good thing is, and we heard Madhav mention this in the yes. morning, that we need another filter. And this, which is the most important piece of science, is missing from the policy discussion today. That you have to move from ambient concentration to exposure, integrated exposure. But a very important development that happened at the policy level in India last year is for the first time where the Union Health Ministry got involved with the debate and the new report that has come out has made that connection. Now this official connection has already been made which very clearly says that you need to shift from ambient concentration management to exposure management. They're saying that the ambient concentration that we conventionally monitor is not a good surrogate for your exposure. You need to monitor where people are. What are they breathing? How much are they inhaling? Now the moment you integrate that with your air quality management, you're completely changing the way you are going to do air quality management in your city. And that's the way we begin to look at it. So it's very important that we should integrate this, and that's a very important lesson that has come out. And because the science now is part of the global discussion, so we have begun to get this kind of data for Delhi as well where Health Effect Institute study shows that the maximum effect of vehicular pollution is up to 500 meters from roadside. When they applied that criteria to Delhi, they found that more than 55% of Delhi's 17 million live within 500 meters from some roadside, and therefore within direct exposure. But a very, and what, what distinct, what difference does it make when you begin to take this? So if you look at the health ministry study, take the top pie chart. That is the conventional source apportionment study, but because I'm giving the example from Chennai because we've done for that city. Now in that you will find that vehicles contribute about 45% of the ambient PM2.5. But if you consider, the, now you do the apportionment differently in terms of exposure. So the moment you do that, then you find that the vehicle's contribution increases to 63%. And that is the message. So we may have a Badapur power plant in Delhi that emits hugely, but that's not within the breathing zone of everyone. And within the breathing zone, what you have is this. So this is a very, it's an amazing invention, uh, innovation that we are beginning to see today, where the low cost monitoring and Govind, they are doing this so well today, that how this helps to democratize the air pollution information, how this brings to the people, where people themselves can understand the risk and what are they inhaling when they're traveling and walking on the road. So this evidence is already out there. The another science which must inform policy today is that for a long time the health studies had said they took PM particulate matter as an undifferentiated particles. They never made a different distinction between what is more hazardous. But the new science, again, and the new studies that have come out, they're saying very clearly that, look, the PM that we're going to get from coal, the PM that we're going to get from diesel are more harmful than the wind-blown dust. Now, the moment this kind of science begins to inform your policy, you will be designing your action trajectory very differently. So therefore, where are we going? So if you look at the trajectory today and how the action is evolving in our city, we know that we are sitting on explosive motorization. But the message from the developing world like India is that the legacy stock of vehicle is much smaller than what is yet to come. And therefore understand the importance of improving the emission standards so that you meet much cleaner benchmark and also the importance of restraint to reduce this explosive number. And both principles have to guide action. Today, if you look at the trends, it's very interesting what we also saw from Mexico City just now, that if you look at the different pollutants, then the uh, sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide have decoupled from the trend in motorization. But nitrogen oxide and particulate matter are still strongly correlated. So which means when you're doing pollution control, you'll have to target those that are emitting more nitrogen oxide and more particulate matter in the city. So therefore, if you look one by one at the what are we looking at today in Delhi, so the technology roadmap, which remains an unfinished agenda, 
Today, when we are saying Euro 4 emission standards in Delhi, that is still more than 10 years behind Euro. And we are motorizing at that level. The unique challenge of India is also the dieselization. And that's where, if, but it's very interesting that the second generation action that is suddenly beginning to get, there's a resurgence in interest today. Because what we lost in terms of the air quality gains of the first generation action, we had slowed down. But since October last year, we are beginning to see a new interest, and both from the Supreme Court as well as government, both state and national. And it's a convergence happening today. But very interesting messages that are coming out from these interventions. Now the Supreme Court is saying that we will not confine ourselves only the territory of Delhi, but we'll take a regional approach. Because you cannot, but air pollution does not follow political boundary, the globe with, between boundaries. So that's a very important intervention. Focus on all pollution sources. Now the source-wise pollution uh, action plan is emerging and, the, and that's the way we're moving forward. But clearly a special focus on vehicles in terms of reducing toxic risk from all diesel vehicles, which means trucks, light commercial vehicles, taxis and diesel cars, because buses have already moved to CNG. They are applying the pollute pay principle. They, there is a, uh, the, 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 the directives today that the, uh, by applying the pollute pay principle, they're making the trucks pay an environment compensation charge. And the money from that is going to a clean air fund. And the court has said very clearly that this revenue will have to be spent for public transport and non-motorized transport. So therefore, we now need to just understand therefore here that how you're mobilizing resources as well for clean air action. So it's a very interesting, so therefore these actions that are already being taken. Delhi government, of course, is also looking at this. So we, we now know the pollution emergency action. They're looking at the augmenting bus transport. So all that, so we are beginning to see. Go a little slow if you want. We've got time. Okay. <laughs> so, so we're talking Delhi. We're talking Delhi. Delhi. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you really look at, uh, here I'm just listing what Delhi government and the central government are looking at. So Delhi government of the action that has already started. So here we have audit even scheme which has started. They are look, so if you look at the new budget that has come from the Delhi government, that is looking at uh, augmenting bus numbers. They have got a target of 3,000 buses this year with infrastructure development and service augmentation. They're looking at infrastructure for walking and cycling on all PWD roads. The, well, the elevated BRT that we have to take with a pinch of salt, something that we do not agree with, we'll discuss that later. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, looking at the parking policy. Central government, as we have heard the minister in the morning, that we are, and this decision is one, one of the most notable and dramatic decisions that has come out, which say that we are going to leave road, we are going to skip Euro 5 and go directly to Euro 6 in 2020. But a very important development in the union budget this year was the differentiated taxation on diesel and petrol cars as an infra tax. Now, this is for the first time we have seen in the central budget the recognition of pollutive principle. That has never happened. So if we can leverage this development and move forward, that's really a big uh, opportunity. And the Amruth and the smart city, that is, depends on us how we are going to define and influence it. So this is an opportunity, there is a hook out there. If we can influence this development well, there is an opportunity that we can move ahead. But it's interesting to see that today, and if you take action, it's also good to see the results. So when uh, the truck uh, entry, and, and that kind of gives you the confidence that if you do something, you're going to begin to see the results in Delhi. So that on the trucks, and we have really, there have been a massive cl uh, clamping down on trucks this time. And the strategy has been that do not allow the non distinct truck to enter Delhi. Whoever enters will have to pay an environment compensation charge, which should make it more expensive to go through Delhi than take the alternative routes around Delhi. So there's an economic disincentive. And third decision that has come about is that Delhi is, has now banned entry of pre-2006 trucks. So this whole implementation process that started in November by December, the new survey showed already a 20% drop in truck entry. The last data that we saw this month shows 50 more than 50% drop in truck numbers in Delhi. And therefore, when you begin to compare the nighttime pollution in Delhi, you do see a lower peaking of the nighttime pollution. Because we, in Delhi, you see three peaks of pollution, the morning, evening, and the night, when the all trucks come inside the city. 
The big, another big challenge of air pollution control is the digitalization because now it is pretty clear that we are neither getting pollution advantage nor climate advantage. So when you look at the data, at what the concern today in India, and especially in Delhi, so diesel cars today are legally allowed to emit several times more nitrogen oxide and particulate matter than petrol cars. Diesel emissions, class one carcinogen for strong link with lung cancer. Black carbon emissions from diesel emissions are several times more heat trapping than carbon dioxide. And the life cycle diesel emissions are high in terms of CO2. So basically what it essentially shows that whether you're looking at it from the pollution perspective or fuel efficiency perspective, you, it is not a win-win. And, and there's a serious concern, especially now, when we know that the technology ladder, we are way down and we do not have clean diesel. So now we know that in China, the penetration of car diesel cars is just 1%. In India, in Delhi, it is more than 50%. And Beijing does not allow diesel cars. So we have to understand this. So here is a, here is a global uh, 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 case study in front of us, both the cities battling pollution, and we know what trajectory they have taken, but why are we repeating the mistake then? So clearly we see the global action in diesel, so we are all waiting for this to happen now, the Euro 6. But we also understand that the Euro 6 is also going to bring in not more sophisticated emission control systems into the market. Particulate trap, SCR, which are highly sensitive to the maintenance and, and the real world emissions can be hugely different if you do not keep them well, if they do not yes. operate properly. Volkswagen is an evidence of that. And all the new data that has emerged, and we don't want to get into that trap. The next part of the story is that India has adopted air quality index. And since in morning we have heard uh, so many good examples from Mexico and other parts that how it is important to have an index to inform people so that people can take precaution. And India has also taken the, this is the official health advisory that goes out with air quality index. So when this was applied to Delhi last winter, we found this. So you actually see that the, uh, if you really look at this number, that in November 2015, we had 73% of the days in the severe category, which is the worst category according to our index. Now imagine if the, the worst means severe means like more, you know, so many several times higher than the standards. And this deserves pollution emergency action. And this is and the reason why we got the odd and even happen. So let's look at the odd and even a little bit. So this is the winter and the particle daily part PM 2.5 level in November, December, January, three months. And this is the previous winter of 2014 and 15. Any winter, because of calm and weather, uh, calm condition, inversion, we know that the pollution peaks, and there's an absolute madness in that uh, uh, trend that you see. And that's several times higher than even the severe, the worst category, that red uh, top horizontal bar. But what you see in this trend, that yes, pollution is peaking continuously, but it is also very uneven a uh, trend, which shows a very high impact of weather. The very, you know, the, whenever there is an inversion, you can see it's peaking. But look at this winter. And correlate all the action that has been taken this winter. It starts with that the top peak that starts with the Diwali peak when the fireworks increases pollution levels dramatically in the city. But after the Diwali peak, pollution is increasing. It is, they, they, it is peaking because of, the uh, because of the winter. But you do see a consistency in the trend. There is a slowing down of the peaking that is happening in the city. And look at, and we have marked, that when different action was taken. So if you look at when the environment compensation charge on trucks was introduced, then it was doubled, then the audit even was done in the first fortnight of uh, January. It is very interesting, if you look at the January when audit even I have marked there in the graph, that that was actually, that period was worse in terms of temperature, inversion, and western disturbance compared to what you had in November and December. And yet you see the peaking of pollution that happened during odd and even is lower than the peaking that happened during November and December. Now it clearly is bringing out the evidence, and even the satellite picture, which is studied by the Miami University, that the fort, and this is the satellite showing you, the, 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 and here you can see the aerosol optical depth so before the, the previous fortnight of odd and even, you see darker pollution which is inside the city. But during odd and even, you see darker pollution outside the city. So the clear evidence that if you take action, you will see results. 
But the bigger challenge, that's where we have to make a connect because a lot of discussion happening today, what will Audin do even do eventually to this city? Because it's a pollution emergency action. But what it has done, and that's the more important, uh, valuable uh, uh, spin-off from this experiment, it is the way people's perception of quality of life that changed during that period. And the way people understood the importance of reducing vehicle numbers on the road. So you do see, and there are other indicators if you look at during that odd and even period, where the journey speed for all modes improved, the fleet uti bus fleet utilization, which is 84% uh, in normal days, increased to 95% during odd and even fortnight. Petrol Dealers Association reported overall drop in diesel and petrol sale in the city. The survey has uh, brought out the improvement in journey speed, average occupancy of car going up. So there are many indicators to capture that. And the question is that what we could achieve during odd and even, the message is that how do we therefore achieve something like this with more sustainable solutions? It is just not for the fortnight. And that's where, where do we go? And that's the connection, and therefore, if people have understood the value of Odin even, then that directly helps us to now make the connection between air pollution and mobility challenge in the city. So when you look at this is the disaster in the making, and this is what is happening in the city today. This is the car bulge and marginalizing all your sustainable mode of transportation. So here, what a kind of action are we really looking at today? So the, in terms of actual policy decision, Delhi government's budget this time has augmented bus numbers, infrastructure improved services, there is a um, Supreme Court directive on buses. But the, but the story, and which is the very worrying part is this, that continuously the bus ridership, and if you really look at the modal share of buses, which was 60% in the year 2000, has already dropped to 4,000. This is the dated data, but we are told that this must have slipped much more by now. So under scanner today, I'm not going to go into the details, but I know that this is under discussion today. This is where the action planning is taking place. The, 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 where you are looking at the infrastructure, rolling stock, quality of bus service, and all that discussions that are happening today. And we certainly want that the whole integration discussion that is taking place today, the physical uh, integration and the norms that are coming up today, that how do we push this agenda better? And when we're talking about integration, it is just not about the bus, it's all the public transport system, including the paratransit, and how do you design a system that enables quick movement and the easy pass of people from one system to the other and the most efficiently connects the destination with origin. The other very important element of the, and I'm going looking at the actual decision that has been taken. So the Delhi government budget has also talked about the investment in walking and cycling infrastructure. And as I said, there is also the directive from the Supreme Court that the Clean Air Fund in Delhi should also be linked with public transport and walking and cycling infrastructure. Now this is what we have in the city today. If you have an access like this to the metro station, that will make the use, utilization of metro suboptimal. We are not going to walk on that kind of a footpath to get to a metro station. So when, if you have street design guidelines, now this change, the retrofitment or the change has just about begun. And we really now need to look at that how do you do planned street improvement across the city? Just not a corridor-based approach, but a network improvement where you enable the movement of people. But the question here is, and that's a, and that's a point that we really need to make, that you may invest in infrastructure, and we certainly want an empty infrastructure today. But this is the sum of the NMT infrastructure that were created during Commonwealth Games in Delhi. But if you look at the design here and the fault in the design here, then you realize that whoever tried to make it just treated it as a beautification project, not as a usable uh, system. I mean, this cyclist cannot even enter. There is not design entry into the track where it starts. So there are many such. So if we, if we invest in the infrastructure, if we cannot maintain that infrastructure, and if we cannot protect that infrastructure from encroachment, then it's a complete waste. And that, therefore, what we are saying, that while you're designing and investing in infrastructure, protection of the infrastructure is even more important. Today, even though our laws are weak, but even today, the Central Motor Vehicle Act does not allow a motorist to uh, enter and park on a pedestrian way. But we never enforce that law, even today. But we have that legal handle. So, we, so therefore, the both will have to go hand in hand. The one, before I end, there were two, two elements that I would really like to uh, in, uh, bring out, something that we have heard since morning. 
Today, when we are uh, uh, investing in infrastructure, transit infrastructure, we want people to use it. Therefore, the redistribution of densification, bringing people to live close to the transit, is going to be the operative principle. But look how our urban planning goes so awfully wrong. If you look at Delhi today, 1% of Delhi live in the heart of Delhi. Because to density control, you do not allow people to live in the central part of the Delhi. So you, this is therefore, the central part is like the suburbs in other part of the world. And you're pushing the majority to the periphery. You're increasing distances. You do not allow people to use the transit efficiently. And therefore, it's, it's absolutely unacceptable. If you look at the density of Delhi, which is the lowest among some of the big metropolises across the world. Now, so therefore, when you build a transit like Metro in Delhi, so you will find that that line goes to some of the very densely populated area, but there are also areas where people don't even live. Now, there's a huge uh, uh, opportunity for redistribution and infilling, and that has to be the policy challenge. So these, so the, therefore the sophistication and the maturity that we now need in our planning is, it has to address this issue. Another big challenge, today Delhi has given this network of public transit, which includes BRT line, metro line. And it is said that once, say, the entire metro line is constructed in Delhi, 80% of Delhiites will live within 400 meters from some metro station. Imagine the opportunity. If 80% of Delhi lives within 400 meters from some Delhi so metro station, which means the whole concept of TOD, the transit-oriented development, that that 400 meter radius, if you make it walkable, if you restrain cars, if you give them cycling opportunities, you can transform Delhi. But we talk about public transport network, but we design road like this. And that's the biggest mistake that can ever happen. This is the structure that locks in so much pollution, where by design, you are removing people from the road, you're pushing them up to the foot over bridge, you do not allow street activity, anyone here cannot even cross a road to access a metro or a BRT station. Now that this means by design, you are telling me, I'm giving you the advantage and the privilege to use the car, but I'm not giving you the advantage and privilege to walk to the metro station. Now, this design is locking in so much pollution, so this is what happens essentially. When you are looking at these signal-free corridors to give advantage to the speed of vehicles, you remove signals, you give flyovers. So just look at this one example in Delhi near Nehru Place. Earlier, before it became signal-free, A to B distance was walkable, cyclable, and connected the neighborhood. After it became a signal-free corridor, the same uh, spot has become a thousand meter distance to cross, just to go to A to B is a thousand meter distance, and that too after you take a foot over bridge. Now, by design, therefore, all the non motorized transport within three kilometer radius of that area has become motorized by design. And no one is, and there is no traffic impact assessment of this kind of uh, infrastructure, pollution impact assessment, to sh see that how this kind of uh, the infrastructure and design intervention is also knocking in pollution. Similarly, if you want TOD, as I said, if 80% of Delhi will live within 400 meters from uh, a metro station, but look, take this example from Gurgaon. So that ITC apartment is actually within 400 meters from the Ipkochok metro station. And if you walk and take that green line, it is a 400 meter distance that you can reach there. But you cannot do this because in that area, we are promoting gated development. You have put walls all around. You have blocked that access. So that 400 meter today is, a, uh, uh, is actually an 1800 meter distance. Now if I have to take a car to come to the metro station, I might have to take the car to my office. Now just see therefore how different issues are actually uh, 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 conflicting with each other. So we certainly need to fix all this. There is already a National Habitat Standard Mission talking about this, but this has not been internalized yet. My last point is about that urban design, giving options, but you also need restraint measures. And the parking, as Dario said, is that they have picked on that as a mo most important first generation restraint measure. The same has to apply to Delhi. So while cars are taking over road space, they're also taking over public space. And that's a huge public cost. So, but it's very important that already Supreme Court and National Urban Transport Policy 
have taken on board the demand management principle and restraint principle of parking policy way back in 2006, but this has not yet been able to influence the on ground. Why are we allowing, uh, so I will finish this. So why, so this is the point that we are trying to say that you are creating overcapacity in parking, giving a valuable space to the parking, not pricing it enough, but we know today globally that parking policy is taken as an air pollution control measure, which is actually contested in Delhi. They do not accept that, how, and they actually question you when you then they say that parking policy is needed, needed as a restraint measure to control air pollution. So deepening public and policy understanding on these issues are very critical to move forward. So we need to act on all this. We have to take away subsidy and look at all the uh, uh, fiscal uh, uh, taxation issues that are also locking in huge amount of pollution and inciting motorization. We need to correct all that. So finally, the point we're making that air quality governance, while where we need to set a clear target, but we also have to act with all kind of strategies to deal with it. My final slide is this, that somewhere along the line, there's a huge disconnect today between the mobility solution for air pollution. Today, people say we have a session on air pollution and then say we have a session on transport. So if the focus is connect, Karo, if we lose this connection, the big connect between parking policy and air pollution, between transit and air pollution, urban design and air pollution, then we'll never be able to clean up the lung of Delhi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anumita. I think, uh, you know, I, I thought we'll have a slightly longish discussion, but we've uh, obviously run out of time. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes, and I do want to get in some questions. So, uh, as you, uh, may I urge you to collect your thoughts, and uh, as we, as you do that, uh, there are a couple of quick points. I mean, drawing on Latin America as an example, you know, there are obviously two or three turning points when you could have either moved ahead or moved back or stayed where you are, which is as good as moving back. What are the things? I mean, are there the economic, administrative, political? issues at play at those points and how did, in your experience, what made these cities overcome those challenges? Well, uh, talking from the experience of Bogota, uh, the, the political leadership really is playing the major role and it has been a political leadership of continuity. Even though there are different political parties, some of the basic principles of give priority to the pedestrian, to the bicycles, to public transport have remained over more than 15 years as the drivers of the policy debate in the city of Bogota with very diverse people, with very diverse political parties. So it's kind of, it's part of the city now. Uh, the car restriction has remained over all this time, no matter what is the political party the imp uh, improvement in the bus uh, system, th there was some decline, but now it's picking up again. And also the debate on the metro as part of the, of the, of the discussion in the city of Bogota. So in terms of policy, I, even though there has been very, very diverse political parties, the policy, the underpinning elements of the policy have been the same. And the city is not willing to fly build flyovers, is not building flyovers, is not willing to build urban expressways. Uh, it's about doing arterials, complete the streets. And now there is a renewed focus on also on road safety and air quality. So uh, I, think, I think those are elements that, uh, as Victor Hugo showed, are so important that whatever you do, you continue. And it's not a matter of a party or a, or a political leadership is a matter of policy for the city. Uh, so, Daizong, can you t t talk a little bit about Beijing? So, I, I mean, I know that there was a very strong citizen movement. Uh, you had a lot of nonprofits measuring air quality, displaying them, and that created a groundswell. H how important is that? And to what extent uh, can something succeed if you don't have that groundswell? Uh, okay. Uh, because uh, air pollution is uh, very visible now in China, so that means our uh, the citizen is very clear about our hair. So this gave our uh, government very high uh, pressures. But when we want to promote, uh, we have uh, experience in last 20 years in Beijing. 
we only thinking when we promote the public transportation, we can move the people from car to the public transit. But, the, but it is not happen. Each time when we uh, 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 build a ten, uh, 10 kilometers rail, we only can attract less than 2% of the car users move to the public transportation. So this is why uh, recently we need focus on uh, 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 demand management. We have a huge debate about the congestion charging and the low uh, emission room. Low emission room is better, it's easy to, 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 to be uh, 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 implemented because you, the track is uh, on the uh, companies. But the congestion charging is a very high uh, debate. The first issue is we want to uh, 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 publish some information to our citizen. That's we are subside the car users in the cities. No, we are not. We invest a, a lot of money into the public transportation, but even based on this situation, we still subside the, the car users. Uh, we do some uh, comparison between Beijing and uh, the U.S. The U.S. each one dollar you spend on the cars. The social will pay nine dollars. That's for uh, your clean air, your 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 road safety, and your 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 health from from the insurance. So they have this kind of uh, relationship. One dollar for car users and nine dollars from the social to 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 to, in, to to pay. So this means in China we have worst the, the oil the quality compared with U.S. We have crazy the driving uh, behaviors compared with the uh, U.S. That means. Even in China, when you uh, spend one Chinese yuan, means you have more than 10 yuan from the social to, uh, to, to, to finance your, your car uses. That 10 yuan means use your lung, use your, 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 your children's hair, and use your, uh, your futures. So uh, this is why uh, we, we want to involve the more public, uh, more people to involve this debate. Then we can find the, the way how the future of China should be uh, really faced. Right. One quick question on dieselization. So, uh, as, as uh, Anumita was saying, that you don't have any diesel cars in Beijing. Yeah. So, one reason why we have so many diesel cars is obviously there is a differential in fuel pricing and subsidies on diesel, and which encourages manufacturers to make more diesel cars and consumers to buy them. So, have you faced a similar situation? And if so, how, how have you tackled that? Uh, okay. China now are moving to uh, new energy cars very fast. So maybe we are maybe the biggest, compared with even bigger than uh, U.S. So, so, so China national uh, government just uh, published some uh, policies. Uh, we want to promote the, 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 the new energy. New energy means uh, hybrid or, or, or pure uh, electronic power vehicles. Uh, but at the meantime, we still feel some challenges. But desert is okay. The challenges is we have a lot of coal in China. So our electronic power is coming from coal. So that means from the original of the, your energy structure now is issues and problems. And uh, so dessert is okay because uh, 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 we import a lot of uh, the oils, but we made a lot of uh, electronic based on the coal because China is the biggest the coal market. Then uh, uh, we also discussion with our government. We want to link the new energy, uh, the, the vehicle sales with the original uh, the, the energy uh, structures. That means like a BMW. Uh, BMW have pre uh, announced the electronic car uh, factories in China. Then uh, we want to link that the part of the profit of BMW should be uh, going directly to, to make uh, the, the, the solar power factories or the, the wind wind farm uh, powers. That means from the demand, we want to change the structure of the supply of, of energy. So uh, this is uh, issues of how we thinking about the, the, the new right. energy vehicles. And then the Beijing have just uh, published a new uh, 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 strategy. We have uh, almost uh, 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 15,000 buses. So in the next five years plan, we will change all the buses to uh, the new energy uh, powers. Right, okay. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments? We've got barely five or six minutes. I'm going to collect all the questions. Yeah, go ahead. Just had the experience of four countries. Yeah, can you introduce but yourself? That will be. Uh, I'm Dr. Minhas. I'm Deputy Chief General Manager with DPC. We, have, we had an experience of four countries. Uh, uh, 
I just want to say in last decade, the public transport of Delhi, especially buses, that has gone conversion to CNG twice, once uh, the standard buses, then the low-floor buses. Uh, my question is to Anumita, can't the same thing with the interference of port can't be done with the private vehicles that all the private vehicles will be converted to CNG to clean the uh, air of Delhi? Okay. Uh, I'll collect some more questions. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Hello. I am Rupinder Singh. I am, you know, uh, inventing so many technologies, things like that. But the biggest strategy is that, you know, we are not promoting hydropower. You know, in last, uh, uh, you can say, 100,000 megawatt of installed capacity, we have added only three or 4,000 megawatt. And they are two are lame duck dams, you know, they are run of the river dams, you know, which are not reliable. So that's a very big concern. Th then th we are not investing in energy efficiency. We can save about 30 to 50 percent of energy in almost every use. We are not doing anything in that, I I including the lead. In the case of BRT, you know, uh, one month before it was inaugurated on one television channel, you know, I pinpointed every single fault in this design. It was very, very faulty design. And, you know, instead, uh, in last eight years, instead of improving it, we have decided to de demolish it. My right. campaign was that, you know, we should be improving it. You know, uh, but, you know, it, uh, it is unfortunate that we have to demolish right. it. Okay. Because on our political, uh, our people, you know, they can't, uh, you can say, provide a better solution. So these are, you know, we need so many things, you know, in, in, in case of our water, you know, our water quality is very, very poor. You know, in Bhakla Dam, you know, water leases from Bhakla Dam is fit for drinking. It is free from minerals, it is free from any, you know, bacteria. But, you know, we are wasting, we are not using that water for drinking purpose. Right. Even, you know, we are using groundwater, even in Punjab, we are using groundwater for, you can say, okay. municipal supply. Thank you very much. Uh, can I Thank get you. some more questions quickly? Yeah, we've got only one or two more minutes. Hello, my name is M.H. James. I'm currently working as a district transport officer in the government of Mizoram. Uh, my question is towards uh, a, a panel from Bogota in Beijing. Uh, what are the approach towards vehicle restriction by the Bogota in Beijing. Uh, is it on a daily basis or a weekly basis? And what is the compliance level? Thank you. OK. Uh, yeah, last question. Yeah, uh, just I'm Shantanu Basu. I'm an engineer and uh, just consultant by profession. I have got uh, just two questions, actually. Just number one, as Anumita was telling and the other uh, speakers also were discussing, I wanted to know, I mean, I'm a bit curious to know about the last mile connectivity business, especially in India, because uh, my colleagues in India, my co-countrymen are a bit uh, somewhat notorious to use this excuse for using their vehicles and not using the public transportation. So how the other countries have adapted this issue, uh, so-called last mile connectivity, how they have addressed? And number two, almost all speakers spoke about SOX and NOX emission in diesel. Now, I am also curious to know whether the other countries have taken this much seriously the SOX and NOX emission uh, cases in right. cases of power plants and other uh, effluents also. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, one more. Okay, last question. Yeah, go ahead. My question is related to Dr. Minas's question. So, in terms of a lot of cities in India, Calcutta, for example, we have a lot of private bus operators. So, uh, I'm really asking about how, how can we better design a subsidy to promote these bus private bus operators to move to cleaner cleaner vehicles because uh, we tend to see that especially commercial operators when they are private they tend to over utilize their vehicles got it Back. okay we've done uh, uh, yeah question. go ahead uh, one last question yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's actually linked so while hi i'm amit so it's interlinked uh, you know we heard the fact that parallel transportation systems etc they've all been created but uh, to Daizong's point, the switchover of people giving up their own private vehicles, moving over to you know, the alternate uh, transportation systems created is fairly low. The uptake's low. We heard about disincentivizing from Anumita while the trucks are disincentivized, et cetera. Do you think there's merit in thought process of incentivizing people to give up their you know, private transportation and moving over to these public utility vehicles and alternate methods? Uh, maybe a thought for food for thought. OK, thank you very much. So Daizong, can I ask you for a one minute sum up. I mean, and if you want to respond to any questions, we're completely out of time. Sorry. Okay. The response to your, your questions. Uh, 
we do analysis China's why the, the car users move to public transit is so difficult because we are at the very beginning phase of the marketing. So, so in China, the car going to the family is only during the last 20 years. So we didn't have very good culture for car use. So uh, we analysis when we uh, have new uh, 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 metro system operated. Only the OD, both O and D, are within 500 meters of the station. The car user might be thinking to use the public transportation because they're thinking the car is uh, kind of the logo of the successful and and it's very high in count the, 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 the image. So this is things we are just the technical people. So we need work with the communication side. We need our superstar to shoot to uh, to to ride a bicycle to to use the public transportation to 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 create a new uh, culture of car use. So, so kind of uh, very complicated, but it's true, the car use didn't come to the real. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, did I yeah, uh, there are questions regarding uh, vehicle restriction in Bogota. I want to explain a little bit because I, I run really fast on it in my presentation. The vehicle restriction in Bogota is very harsh. It is started with 40% restriction on the peak hours. And then it was increased to 50%, that means even all. But it's all the time. And it is a congestion relief measure. It is not for air quality, it was a congestion relief measure. The result that only using the peak hour has been positive because the people can still use the car before or after the peak hour. And the uptake of a second vehicle has not been as high, but it has been. So the next generation of traffic demand management is not vehicle restriction, is desensitizing with economics. First, with parking, but this, the city has also submitted to the city council congestion charge three times. The city council has rejected congestion charge three times because it's very difficult for politically in terms of, of, of putting those economic measures. But the city will insist because those are the right things to do. The restriction by itself, it's very short term. If you need to a structural change, you need the, uh, the economic disincentive. And then there was a question on last mile connectivity. When the BRT system was designed, was not just about the bus lanes, was also the feeder routes. The feeder routes were not an afterthought, as in many other cases have been. It was an integral part. It's so integral that 50% of the riders of the BRT use the feeder buses. So it's, it's an integrated system. It's not just one corridor or some corridors. So those are very important points that were made. And regarding the last question of incentivizing non-motorized transport, we are seeing examples now in Europe. Uh, in Italy, they are paying people to ride a bicycle. And it's much cheaper than creating the space for the car to park. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Victor Hugo, do, you, uh, do, you, do any of you want to respond to the point on buses, private buses versus public owned buses? Well, or, or essentially yeah, who's going to put the money just down? Just to, 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 to advance that, it doesn't matter the ownership at the end. It's the economic system behind. If the economics work, it could be private, it could be public. There is a problem in many public undertakings that they spend too much money and become very expensive. And there is a problem in private undertakings that they don't have enough control. So it's not an ideological, it's about the institutional backing and the contracts and the incentives. I do think a, a good system of control of private operation works well if the contracts are well written and all the incentives are in place. And many of these incentives could be for cleaner vehicles, cleaner uh, cleaner fleets. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, technologies uh, for uh, buses, uh, I think that the, the the right direction is to go for hybrids and and, and electrics. Agreed. Even uh, CNG is a is a good measure for the short term, and diesel ultra clean vehicles is a good measure for the short term, but uh, finally both are fossil fuels. Yep. And they, they produce uh, pollutants and they produce uh, climate uh, uh, forces. 
So um, I think that the, for, for, the, for the buses, we should look at the, at the electric and the hybrids. And um, the other thing is that the, the restrictions of, of vehicles is, is only one part of the problem. Um, population is growing. Uh, and uh, even if you put restrictions, uh, finally one day you have congestion and uh, you have air pollution problems. So uh, I think that um, these ideas of uh, limit the number of vehicles uh, uh, that can have a plate in a city, we must look uh, closely to that. Uh, there is a, a capacity of, uh, of, uh, of roads to support vehicles in uh, acceptable conditions. Uh, if you go more than that, uh, you, you have problems. Right, thank you. Uh, Anumita, can I just ask you for, you know, the one thing that you would, you think that we should all focus on, and you had a very long presentation, but you know, just the one thing, I mean, is it, is it attitude, is it, uh, you know, understanding of data? Okay, so, I if you want to respond, respond to, to the gentleman's question on question. Uh, CNG so, as well. Yes. So one is that um, as a matter of public policy and public good, uh, government should focus on incentivizing the public transport. And so when we look at the CNG program in Delhi, it's a win-win from the perspective that you push the public transport in terms of buses, taxis, and autos to move to clean fuel and augment them, augment their numbers. So in this case, therefore, the strategy that was taken was a mandate and also fiscal policy of maintaining a tax differential, a favorable taxation policy which keeps CNG lower than diesel. Now, that is a matter of public good, but we will not like to push that in the private car sector. In that segment, you need to give, you need to give emission standards roadmap, discourage dirtier fuel uh, and use taxation uh, to do that and push them towards clean petrol, CNG, electric, wherever. Because this is a very critical point, which is not about uh, CNG in uh, private vehicles, but also the scrappage policy that is getting discussed today, that whether public money should be used to scrap cars or not. In many ways, when you're tying up public money to incentivize more car ownership, car usage, creating a car market, and stimulating car market. So that is not something that we should promote in terms of public good. In, yep. ca in case of cars, we should only have a strategy to reduce the dependence on cars. And that's my answer to your question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. That, uh, so basically what we really need to do is that beyond the technology um, uh, mandate or emission standards or public transport strategy, we really need to now change the value system. And somewhere along the line, while design and taxation have to take away the privileges from the car, but you also need ways of glamorizing and reinterpreting public transport, public space, building community as a new value and right. principles of the new age. Right. So if we can do that, we will see the change. Right, and that's a very good note to end on. Thank you so much, Anumita. Thank you, uh, my Thank panelists, you. for an excellent uh, uh, discussion and, and a very informed presentation, which hopefully will give you all the data points and the insights uh, to make the next two days uh, more uh, fruitful and relevant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to mention, but the minister did not make it, and which is why we uh, took the liberty of going on till 1.30. <laughs>